Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Today, I am Eric. Hi, Eric. And you are Michael. I am. And we are doing double feature. Mm -hmm. And we have two movies that are on double feature. Sometimes people tell us that we do not do enough comedies. Yeah, that's true. We get that a lot. I think 80% of the movies we do are hilarious. Absolutely. So I don't know what they're talking about. But uh, we definitely have some comedies yeah, we on do. the show today. What are we doing? We're doing Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and The Invention of Lying. So what was the idea here besides comedy? Oh, uh, it was b- besides just comedy. It was smart comedy. It was a kind of a it was kind of a loaded comedy. Yeah. Not just comedy, I right. guess is kind of what that is. Um Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is doing a lot of uh I would say pulpy noir kind of stuff. Yep. Um some meta commentary, great narration mm-hmm. is what that movie is. And actually, The Invention of Lying has some narration yeah, in it, too, which odd is narration. kind of weird. The Invention of Lying is something that I don't think you really need to make a case for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I think if you showed someone one random scene, they would know it's kind of something mm-hmm. different. The Invention of Lying, people are going to be scratching their heads. Yeah, that it's, that's it's even a Trojan horse of a film. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So we're going to talk about the actual substance of that, and hopefully people saw it. Otherwise, they're just going to think we're crazy. They might think we're crazy anyways, and I'm fine with that. We're going to spoil both of those movies. <laughs> just It sounds funny. After, I mean, Invention of Lying looks like a romantic comedy, and now I'm talking about how we're going to spoil it. And Kiss Kiss Bang Bang as well, and that film is fucking spoilable. Absolutely. You want to talk about oh that. Oh, my God. I think Invention of Lying you need to spoil in order to get people to watch it. Mm-hmm. So that one's probably fine when we talk about that. But first up will be Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and there's a lot of hard-boiled detective mystery stuff going on. I'm not even sure after two watches that I follow it yet. Yeah, it's so, really complicated. So I don't know if I could spoil it, but I think we're going to. So you can use the chapters in your iTunes, in your QuickTime, and in your other stuff. And skip Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and go directly to The Invention of Lying or head over to the end of the show. Which means that Robert Downey Jr. is up first. So Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is... it's. It's barely disguised. Yeah. It's a (laughs) comedy, but it's barely disguised as something far greater than a comedy. Mm -hmm. This film has probably three or four layers. Yeah. The first layer. At the very least, three or four, I would say. (laughs) The first thing that you notice about the film is that it's funny. I mean, you get the introductory scene with the little girl that gets sawed in half. Right. And then immediately you get Robert Downey Jr.'s narration. So the narration to this film is Robert Downey Jr., and if anybody has ever seen a recent Robert Downey Jr. film, Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Sherlock Holmes, you know that he has a very specific speaking style that seems super offhanded. Ricky Gervais is good at it, too. Yeah, yeah. And so having him narrate the film, it's already giving you two layers. You have what's going on in the film, but then you have the second layer where your narrator is kind of stumbling over the film as you're trying to grasp it anyway. Sure. The first thing you really get about the movie is you realize that your narrator is bad yeah yeah not a good person not an unreliable narrator i think he's a pretty reliable narrator but not a good guy the first thing that happens is he's robbing a toy store right yeah and his partner gets shot and this is what quote brings him to the party he stumbles he stumbles into an audition i guess right and it just so happens the subject matter is about the same thing that just happened to him right so his performance is uncanny yeah. because he's living it. Because before that part of the movie, it's just bad Santa. Right. I mean, it's Christmas and we're just stealing toys. Right. So we see the narrator come in when Harry, that's Harry Lockhart, that's Robert Downey Jr.'s character, sure. gets brought to Hollywood as, I guess he gets brought in as an actor, a new a new up and comer <laughs> yeah. to, to take the place in a blockbuster film. And we find out later he's up there to shave a couple million off Colin Farrell's paycheck. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um. But so wait, what is the idea there? Just so we're so Colin Farrell wants a lot of money. Right. And so they're going to bring in this new guy and say, you know what, Colin Farrell, we don't need you anymore. And that's supposed to exactly. bring it's the negotiations down. Him. Okay, they're trying to make Colin Farrell Got it. Fe- feel like his his job security <laughs> right. is at risk. Right. So Harry's at the party and this is when the narrator kind of skips out on stuff and you realize he's telling the story haphazardly and he's not. He's not a narrator. Yeah. He's a New Yorker. Yeah. As they say later on in the film. Yeah. The party is where you get introduced to every character in the film. That's why I like the first scene. You get introduced to 
Perry Van Trike, which mm. is Val Kilmer, who plays Gay Perry. And then Gay Perry represents Dabney, who's who's also Harry's agent. So he plays our private eye. In this. Right. He's the one who most clearly resembles. I mean, there's a, a lot of parts of the story that they point to and say, see, this is like detective novels. Right. Uh, the one specifically that they use. Johnny in Gossamer. The, yeah, in, in the film all the time. But he is our private eye. Um, eventually, we'll have two private eyes. Right. And then we also get introduced to Harmony Lane, who is the femme fatale, but mm-hmm. a really odd femme fatale because she <laughs> yeah. has a dirty fucking mouth. Yeah. And then the third character ends up being the villain, who's Harlan Dexter, played by Corbin Burnson. But we get this great scene right in the beginning, and the narration is what gives it away. The scene, I don't know if you remember it, but Harry and Gay Perry are talking, and they're talking about how Harlan Dexter's daughters come back and drop the lawsuit and everything's right, great. Right. And then the film stops in the in mid reel. There's mm-hmm. a there's a tape scratch sound. Yeah. And the narration comes over and says, Oh, gee, I wonder if that scene will come yeah, back. Right. It's calling out the hamster style. Yeah, it is. Is what yeah. it is right there. Yeah. And that's what and that's went- not the only hamster style right. we're gonna get. There's also the pistol that comes right. back as well. <laughs> so they point out one hamster style and they say, Oh, I wonder if that's gonna come back. And they introduce something else that comes back that they don't point out to you. Almost like the hamster style is the red herring as well. Right. Well, that's what you find out with a lot of the narration is that it calls out the bad film stuff mm-hmm. that the film does. Right. Which allows it to get away with exactly. doing the bad film stuff. A lot of times if a film calls out that it's doing something, that doesn't make it okay. No. But this film has two things going for it. One, the narrator's funny. Yeah. And you want to just laugh. You laugh first, think about it later. And the second thing is you understand that the film is supposed to be mysteriously paralleling one of these pulp noir books yeah. that came out in the 50s, the Johnny mm-hmm. Gossamer books that they talk about. So another one that's really good with the narration that I love is at the end. Perry wheels himself in after being yeah. shot, and the narration comes over and says, oh, gee, yeah, I know, boo hiss. I don't like when they bring people back either. Well, fuck, why don't we just bring every fucking person back? And <laughs> yeah. Abraham Lincoln walks yeah. in. That's the best one. And you have Elvis at the end, <laughs> right. too, trying to get in the door. And then another one that they call out is the end of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. The third Lord of the Rings. Well, as soon as the epilogue comes right. up. Right. And that's the feeling you get. You know, I've seen it, like I said, I've seen it twice. And I did not remember anything about it uh, the second time around when I watched it. And I had that reaction. And then I remember having the reaction the first time. Soon as I get an epilogue, I mean, they close the film and then here comes the epilogue. And that's exactly what you think to yourself. So the film gets away with a lot of this stuff by saying what you're thinking almost before you even know you're thinking it. And then it almost gives you shit about it. I mean, in the instance where he, um, you know, he wheels in at the end, Robert Downey Jr.'s character, you know, that narration basically says, well, that's how it's happened. What, yep. you know, what the fuck do you want me to do? Yeah. I'll lie to you about it. You know? Yeah. They say that's how it goes. That's how the story goes. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's normally how a pulp book would end. It right. ends kind of on a good note because pulp books are always lowest common denominator. We talk about that a lot. Yeah. But they're just meant to appeal to the mass of people. If you want to go all the way back to it's weird because it's a Robert Downey Jr. movie, too. But uh, The Singing Detective, which was the the first fucking movie we ever did on this show, you know, with uh, 12 Monkeys, that talked a lot about those old pulp books Mm -hmm. as well. So another thing that the film does that kind of diverts it from the pulp aspect is Mm -hmm. it's actually it's a two parter. One, it realizes the rules. Mm -hmm. It takes things that are normally, you know, luck and chance and smoke And kind of goes, no, that's not how that would ever work in real life. (laughs) And the other thing it does is it paints a realistic portrayal of Hollywood, and that works as an antagonist to the story. So the first thing is things like uh, one of my favorite parts in the film was the 8% chance. Yeah. Where he's, they decide, what are they playing, fag and New Yorker, (laughs) not good cop, bad cop. Right, right. And they're trying to get this nurse to tell them information about the Harlan Dexter's daughter case, which is kind of the main driving case. Mm -hmm. We'll get to what goes on in the (laughs) film later. Right, let's not even talk about that right now. So Harry takes a revolver, empties out the bullets, puts one bullet in, classic Russian roulette move, you know. Uh, We saw it in uh, in Tacto. Yeah. And so he, in a real badass, straight up noir scene, he's beating every word, you know. He's going, okay, man, listen, where is the girl? And blows the guy's head clean open. Well, right, because he doesn't think that the bullet's going to fire. I mean, that's the thing about the noir stuff is luck is always on their side. And it's suspension of disbelief that you just have to believe that in that instant, that was the, you know, the lucky or unlucky shot, maybe in that case. 
um, where the bullet just happens to not be in the chamber. It's not that round, and the first couple clicks, you know, scare the guy, and you get the information that way. That happens in all other pieces of noir. Right. This is the one occurrence where luck is never on his side. Uh, maybe even on the side of the other characters, but never on the side of Robert Downey Jr.'s character. Everything he does is unlucky. It's almost, you know, if you're going to flip a coin 10 times, mm-hmm. you expect half the times it's going right, to land on sure. heads. If you flip fucking movies 10 times, all of them always land on heads. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is the movie that just lands on tails every right. time to try and balance out all of the other <laughs> right. noir throughout history where everyone's been lucky. Exactly. And I think a lot of that comes into play because Harry Lockhart is the only non-Hollywood guy. Yeah. He's the non-LA person. And in this film, like I said, LA is this beast and it's yeah. just chewing him up. Every other character, they correct him on everything. They correct him on his procedure. Mm. They say, don't throw guns into the lake. Right. He's he's trying to do New York crime, yeah, right? Yeah. He chucks the gun into the lake, removes you know fingerprints from what might be going on. He pisses on corpses. All the stuff they do in New York all the time. Sure. But then they go on to correct his grammar. <laughs> right, and his math. <laughs> well, his grammar and his math right. are terrible. I yeah. mean, they need correcting. And the other thing that's really funny is, is they do... A lot of things with the dialogue that I think are really brilliant. Like what? Specifically the thing that it's another, it's another, it's a jab back at noir. Mm -hmm. It's look up the word idiot in the dictionary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll find. And, you know, nine times out of 10, the answer is a picture of you. But Robert Downey Jr. goes, okay, I've seen this. I, I know Hollywood. Yeah. He says, a picture of me. And Perry Van Trike says, no, the definition of the word (laughs) idiot, which you fucking are. Yeah. But I sympathize with Robert Downey Jr. in this situation. Uh, I, you know, LA is one of the few places I will ever say this about, but I cannot fucking stand Los Angeles. I've spent a very minimal amount of time there and it's possible I've not given the city a fair shake. Uh, but I think I had to be there for two days once or something. And it was about the worst two days. Everybody I met was cynical and evil. I just, it's possible that there was just a line of perhaps the city just ejected all of the awful people and made them surround the airport, and I just ran into every single fucking one of them. But it's the commentary that he's giving in the movie. That's all the the East Coast versus West right. Coast stuff about it being fake and plastic and uh, this heightened sense of Hollywood being very theatrical and him not being able to deal with that. And I just, wait, what's the thing they say about holding up uh, the East yeah. Coast and shaking it? It's like it's like somebody grabbed the country yeah. by the East Coast and gave it a shake and all the normal girls managed to hang on. Right, right. And that's how I felt about L.A. And it drove me absolutely insane. Anytime we watch a movie that's about Hollywood culture, it always amazes me how much, you know, when we see films that are about Chicago they're always full of crime and mobsters and the, the, child's play is a really good example of remember, <laughs> yeah. remember they go to what is it <laughs> lower Wacker drive or right, something, right. something right by the river, which there are national like preserves. There's a Vietnam Memorial, right, right. but in child's play, it's riddled with homeless people right. and flaming garbage cans. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Really? The romantic comedies are the only ones set in Chicago that accurately portray it. You know what I mean? What else? We saw Chicago and Candyman. Right. But I mean, to be fair, that's kind of what that neighborhood is yeah, actually like. That's pretty accurate. So I feel like it's a little unfair that maybe L.A. is just portrayed to be like Hollywood, theatrical Hollywood. And it's not like that out there. And then I went out there and it was and I was really sad by that. Well, and the film knows that the film uses that to its advantage it takes the fish out of water thing yeah. and kind of kind of it like i said before it lets hollywood swallow harry mm-hmm. he loses a finger <laughs> yeah. and then a dog eats it i mean God. literally hollywood is swallowing harry lockhart right, right but one thing great about hollywood is bullets go through stuff right yeah that's another example of taking some of these movie cliches and it doesn't even really point those out but it's it's twice in the movie that someone is fired at and the bullet i you know in the very beginning the bullet grazes his uh, mm-hmm. shoulder. And then later, the fucking bullet go- not only goes through the other person, but uh, it goes through the book right. as well. The book, which would have stopped to- the bullet in yeah, every other right. film. Right. And they point out the book, but they never point out the fact that bullets do actually go through people and just throwing someone in your way would not. Right. Human know, shield that. Yeah. is not a 100% effective <laughs> yeah. way of protection. Yeah, right. Okay. So I guess the last thing to do with this film is kind of 
talk about what actually goes on. All right, you haven't even started, and I'm already confused. So it's important to note that there are three dead women. Okay. There are three important dead women throughout the plot of the film. Hold on, I have to change my notes. The film's based on a book, loosely, called The Bodies Are Where You Leave Them, which is a fantastic title. Yeah. It's have you read this book? It's a fantastic noir title. No. <laughs> of course I mean, not. I, know I don't plot. even know why I, I, I asked I you that. I Wikipedia it or something. Oh, well, good for you. I don't doublesleepynaptime.com, man. Um, it's probably on Audible. Uh, bookshow.doublefeatureshow.com. I have also not read or listened to this book. So it's a pulp book. It's, it's very similar to the Johnny Gossamer books. That's mm-hmm. what the whole thing is based on is this pulp book, but then it's kind of it's modernized. I love the idea that you would base a movie on a book and then use your movie to make fun of the book. That's right. great. That should happen more. That's kind of almost the naked lunch thing, right. right? I mean, that's done with more respect, obviously. That's almost done in the opposite direction where it says naked lunch cannot be made into a film. We're going to do something a little bit different uh, with it. But I love the idea of you buy rights to a book and then you create a movie to make fun of that. Yeah. Okay, so there are three dead women, and Got they're it, all three. important parts to the crime aspect of the film. All right. Okay, so Harlan Dexter is this Hollywood ex-Hollywood actor, now Hollywood hotshot, mm-hmm. who was in the Johnny Gossamer movie, which went through Indiana, which is where Harmony and her sister both live. It's also important to note that Harmony and her sister have an abusive father who's raping her sister night after night. They touch on it in the very last scene of the film, yeah, the where guy Perry the smacks him up. And he's, ooh, he's creepy. Does that guy not remember what's going on? He seems pretty genuine and how he he just feels like he's an asshole. He's, why are you coming in here smacking me around? Maybe I, he's senile? I, I don't know if he's senile. I think a lot of times people think that it's okay. I mean, yeah, I don't think you can it. really or continue denial. to do something. Exactly. Sure. Kind of like Magnolia. Remember that plot yeah. thread in Magnolia? Right. I won't tell you which of the 35 characters that applies to. But yeah, that was something we saw there too. So the three people that die in the film are Harmony's sister... A character actress, played by Shannon Sossman, who's a character actress. Okay. And that's the one with the pink wig. Got it, pink wig. And then there's a third character who we never see alive, and that's Harlan Dexter's actual daughter. She's the one in the back of the car that goes flying off the cliff. Those are the three bodies. Harmony's sister kills herself Mm -hmm. because she goes and she's following Harlan Dexter because Harmony tells her that an actor from the Johnny Gossamer movie is her biological father, and her biological father is actually not her father. He's just a bad person. All right. Harmony's sister sees Harlan Dexter fucking the girl with the pink wig. Got it. Thinks it's her shiny new father yeah, yeah. fucking his daughter. Right. So it's it's the same thing from right. before. The Okay. Yeah. So I, she kills absolutely. herself in disgust and then yeah. hires Perry to film incest, mm-hmm. which is where they go, and f- that is when they find... Harlan Dexter's real daughter, who has been killed, in they find her in the lake, in the mm-hmm. back of the car. So the only living character now, the, the only living female, is the character actress who Harlan has hired to play his daughter in order to withdraw the lawsuit and everything goes kosher in the family. Right, right. And that's who he's fucking. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's fucking this actress. And it's not incest. It's not incest. It's important <laughs> to say that it is not incest. So the reason they have to kill off this actress is because Harlan Dexter's daughter's boyfriend is coming in from France Mm -hmm. and he will recognize the difference. So they have to kill off this actress. They have to kill off the daughter. Right. And now they're just going to cremate the daughter, have a funeral for her, and no one will be the wiser. Got it. Got it. That's essentially the plot of the film. It sounds so easy when you explain it in a straightforward <laughs> fashion. Well, the problem is it's it's convoluted through love stories and Ike, Mike, and Mustard. Yeah. And, and there's just characters that you don't really know anything about. You can't find their background. Their narration's too funny. Yeah, I find <laughs> myself so distracted by the narration that anytime Robert Downey Jr. is talking, I'm not paying attention to what's right. going on. That's what I love about the movie, though. I love that you have to keep watching it and that it's a comedy that makes you do that. The you misdirection know? is the jokes. Exactly. Yeah. I like that it's a comedy that, that proves far more complicated than you can imagine if yeah. you're laughing. Yeah. You really have to watch it so many times that you're, the jokes are gone. Yeah. You don't see the jokes. You know the joke. I mean, you can attest. When you and I were watching, yeah. I was saying You mouth the, the words lines. like you're at your favorite band's concert. I mean, it takes a lot of watching to understand the plot and not just be cracking up at the jokes. And I didn't didn't say it, but I think it's the funniest movie. This is pretty much the opposite of what you would find with any other. I mean, you talked about it in the intro. We talk about this stuff in the show all the time. Lowest common denominator. 
the purpose, uh, the most common purpose, let's mm-hmm. say, of a comedy is to make everybody have a good time. You show up a lot of times, you know, when, when we look at the invention of lying, we'll see how much uh, visually it just looks like every other comedy. Something like Shaun of the Dead sort of does that too, where it doesn't have... A, uh, I mean, we're not dealing with Tarantino Rodriguez right, again. Right. It's not a distinctive style. It's something that's very appealing. Uh, that's just not its intent. It's not its focus. And a lot of times I think comedies are just completely afraid of that. So you don't want something complicated. You don't want something that has to make people think mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, so the common wisdom goes. You just want people to show up and laugh and have a good time. And so people show up to this movie and laugh and have a good time. And then they all miss the mystery because they're not paying attention close enough because you can't, the jokes are too funny. And it's really strange to me that such a brilliant comedy comes from the same guy that did lethal weapon. Yeah. And the long kiss. Good night, which was a weird film from last action hero. Yeah. They're all, I mean, I don't want to knock them. Yeah. I can see the, the tie ins though. I guess now that I know that I can kind of look back. I mean, especially the long kiss. Good night being sort of a modern noir kind of thing, but it doesn't have the smart script. I mean, that's, that's why Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is what it is, right. aside from, of course, the acting. And I guess there's a lot of stuff that goes and into And it's that. really kind of the last thing Shane Black did. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been rumors of a new lethal weapon. Yeah, there's other stuff, and, but it's and, not it's not nearly as popular as all that right. other, uh, all the 90s stuff that came out. And I, I mean, I feel like this is kind of, this is where... I feel like this is where he's been going. Right? <laughs> that's where you want to end. It's where, yeah. It's, I mean, I wanted you got to say that. Better than I wanted this. to say that, yeah. but I didn't want to go. No, you I think should that's quit your career, Mr. <laughs> right. Black. Hey, this is Joel David Moore from your favorite movie, Hatchet. Join the Hatchet Army. Listen to Double Feature. Well, I suppose we just go 180 then and talk about Ricky Gervais. So let's just talk about Ricky Gervais yes. first. Before we, I'm going to make my case for this film. It's Great. going to happen. And you, you agree with me I about totally, this stuff, Okay, right? I should say right now that mm-hmm. Eric and I are on the same page with this film. All right, all right. So Ricky Gervais, we've somehow never talked about on yeah. the show. Uh, this is a kind of a weird thing because Ricky Gervais popularized podcasting. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he might be the reason we're doing this show today, although he wasn't a direct inspiration or anything. Right. Podcasting would not be nearly as big as it is without uh, the show that he did and bringing all of the attention to that. I've gone through and I've listened to, I'm pretty sure, all the podcasts he's he's done, uh, the audiobook stuff. You have accidentally right. heard his podcast. Right. Well, they started airing on HBO. Yeah. Uh, the quote Ricky Gervais show, right. which is actually just an animated version <laughs> of the Ricky Gervais show yes. podcast. It's literally the podcast with animation. And it's, it's possibly it's possibly one of the funniest shows on television. It's great. And it's just animated talking. Carl Pilkington. Carl Pilkington. That's really it. That's yeah. That's, that's all at. you have to say about that. Uh, Ricky Gervais, wicked fucking smart guy. So everybody knows The Office. Uh, most people probably know that the American version of The Office came from the British version of The, the Office. The British version came from the Japanese version. What? Uh, and Ricky Gervais created the British version. The Japanese version actually came from the American version. So did you know there was a Japanese version of The Office? A real Japanese I, version? I haven't verified that, but I do know that it's I know. been localized to 15 different Jesus countries. Or so It's ridiculous how popular that show has gotten. It's weird because usually they just dub it and put it out in other countries, but they literally just remade the show in all of these uh, different countries. But anyways, Ricky Gervais has been doing a lot of film stuff lately. He did a show called Extras, Mm -hmm. which doesn't get as much praise as it deserves. That was another HBO show. Uh, Yeah, and another show that was really fucking smart. The BBC production first and then came over uh, to HBO, but... A show that starts innocently enough, like a lot of Ricky Gervais's stuff, and kind of snowballs into handing you a point you did not know that you were seeking out. A lot of the stuff that he talks about in extras is uh, lowest common denominator art right. versus something sure. that is really powerful, but no one will pay attention exactly. to it. And how there's very few directors, very few creators who can do both. Most people have to do reality TV or something really base and stupid, Mm -hmm. and that gets popular, or you do something incredibly smart and no one sees it. And the irony of that being that it was on HBO, and when I talk about extras, no one knows what I'm talking about. They think, which DVD? So the number one thing that I want people to know about The Invention of Lying, a movie written and directed 
by Ricky Gervais and, of course, starring Ricky Gervais as well. And a billion other weird yeah. cameos. You know, I would hope that the other weird cameos lured people in, but I think we, you I and think, I are the only two that go IMDb fishing, right. and I don't know if other people do that. I think that. a lot of, I mean, what it was for me, because, so you told me, see the invention of lying, it's smart, and I go, huh? And you go, see it, and I go, okay, that's kind of how we usually right. do films. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what happens. <laughs> um, and I was watching it going, wow, look at all these people in yep. this movie. There's yep. there's Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Is that Edward Norton? Yes, it is Edward Norton. There's a John Hodgman part I like. Right. Oh, there's tons, tons of people. Jennifer Gardner somehow wound up yeah. in this movie. As, Rob uh, Lowe is <laughs> great in this movie. Rob Lowe in this movie. And half of the cast of Arrested Development, I believe, <laughs> appear in the film <laughs> right. as well. Also, I have to mention that Louis C.K. is in it. Louis C.K. has a new show on FX right now, actually. That's it's a comedy, but it's insanely dark, super, super bleak at the risk of sounding really pretentious, which is never what we want to do on double feature. But I'm going to do it anyways. The show, it's called Louie, and it, it's kind of profound in its own way, if that makes sense. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe you'd have to see it to know what I'm talking about. But if you like dark comedy stuff, it's one of my favorite things right now. It's really, really smart. I mean, he writes it. He directs it, and he does the editing, and it's just fucking awesome. All right, back to the invention of lying. So the number one thing that people need to know about this is that it is not the Jim Carrey sort of bullshit, empty-headed comedy it looks like. Right. Even the trailers will make it, the DVD packaging will make it look like that. Well, it's the seems... Pro- what's the premise of this film for the five people who have not heard of it? Essentially, it's it's the, what, the opposite of liar, liar? Yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. It's it's the opposite of liar liar and not quite yes man is yeah. what we're going to call this. It's a world where lying has never been conceived. Everyone it's, tells the truth it's, all the time. It's not that people choose to tell the truth, it's that people don't know how to lie. Right. They don't know what it is. It doesn't exist there. And one man discovers the ability to to, to make up stuff, make things up and say the the untruth. So you uh you see this trailer and it's, of course, all of the stupid moments you would expect. Right. It's the moments where he tells a chick that the world is ending so that she'll bang him. That kind of stuff. Right. All of that. The fucking Yes Man trailer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's all of that stupid shit. And it all happens pretty much in the first 15 minutes of the film. I mean, by the time he invents lying, they go through a two minute gag reel of that stuff to get it all out of the way. Right. And then the film advances Far and fast. So even as I was getting into all of the Ricky Gervais podcasts and really enjoying them, I would see this trailer. I would see him do interviews different places. And the people asking him questions for the interviews were asking the kind of questions you would you would fucking ask Adam Sandler when he was right. doing Click. Yeah. A remote control that controls real life. A movie that takes that premise and then tries to stretch it out for two hours like any of these comedies do. So you had no idea. It's only by sheer accident that I gave in, watched this, and went, wow, why is no one talking about mm-hmm. all of the other crap going on in this movie? I would never have seen this. No, film. not at all. Not at all. So it's a disguise. I think that what's going on in this movie, it's fully aware that it looks like a bullshit romantic comedy. It knows that in the trailer. And I think maybe even if it's not intentional, it is a wonderful disguise. Yeah. If you can say anything, one thing about this movie, I think that it's smart. I think that's what you say about it. I usually, whenever people ask me what it is, Mm -hmm. I essentially go, it's a brilliant Ricky Gervais movie. Yeah, there you go. Brilliant is the word I use. I think it might even be better given that it has this uh, this romantic comedy thing that pushes people away. Because then the people, we talked about this a little bit with South Park. Uh, I'm working on a whole fucking side thing that just runs with this premise right now that maybe I'll announce five years from now when I actually goddamn <laughs> finish it. But I'm doing another show that runs with that entire premise of disguising, Trojan yeah, Trojan horsing something, disguising something and handing it to people who didn't know they wanted it. We talk about that with our show and the skepticism stuff. Yeah, well, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's taking something very, very intelligent, smart, and necessary, something people need to examine, mm-hmm. and putting it in a lowest common denominator Package. candy coating. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, like you said when we were watching the film. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go in. I'm, I want you to expound on this sure. because I don't want to. We'll get to this what we're you. talking about eventually. But what you said is it's really important because it shows an audience that would never no. think about this yeah. stuff. It shows the lowest common denominator audience something that they aren't prepared for and that they're not going to think about the very audience who needs it the most they are the people who wander into this 
you know, we can talk about pretentious art films all day long, all of the time, but the people who see those movies are people who know that they want to go and see those movies or who had to accompany me on a date to one of these movies. Mm -hmm. Those are the only people that see them. The people who go see these Adam Sandler grown fucking ups. awful. See yeah, grown ups. That, yeah, that bullshit. These ideas are never presented to them. So here you have a movie that Trojan horses these ideas on them. All of these people wander into this movie thinking it's going to be a bunch of dumb jokes and they're not going to have to think. And then all of a sudden they do. Okay, so your mother's on her deathbed mm -hmm. and she is she is scared and she does not want to die an atheist's death, as I will say. Uh -huh. She doesn't want to die and be dead. Right. That's what you and I believe happens. Sure. That's what you and I are, are firmly... Seems to be what the evidence suggests, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. You die and you are dead and that is the end. You rot in the ground. But if for a moment you could guarantee to, to make the final moments of your own mother the happiest in her entire life, what would you do? Or what would you do if you were Ricky Gervais? <laughs> well, Eric Ingram. All right, so here's where it, where it presents this to you. It play, you know I love thought experiments. You know I love when films uh, do this. So this is a world, um, unlike the fiction of, say, Constantine or that movie with the paintings and the Robin Williams. What was that thing called? Uh, what Dreams May Come. God, that was terrible. Unlike those movies, this movie is set in a fictional universe, much like ours, where there is no God. There is no afterlife. You die, and that is it. And because there's no lying in this universe that's in the film, everyone knows that. The concept of God does not exist. So what Ricky Gervais does in this moment, he's been playing the experiment constantly of what can I do with lying? All the gags you would hope to see from the trailer, all mm -hmm. your favorite bits. But this is when the movie gets heavy, and it gets heavy pretty fast. Uh, it gets heavy in a scene that is also pretty emotional. As well. I mean, Ricky Gervais breaking down and crying in the scene. Uh, just really, really heavy stuff. He tells her that there is an afterlife. There's absolutely an afterlife. There's absolutely a God. There's a fucking loving God. And you get a mansion. He actually never mentions the man in the sky. No, to his he mother. Did, no, he doesn't mention the man in the he sky. Mentions happiness her, but... and all your friends are there. Everybody right. who's ever died is there. Well, that's the thing about lying, Michael, is sometimes it just spirals out of control. So he turns around and the entire staff of the, I guess it's a hospital it's staff. It's a hospital, sure. Right. Although, what do they call it? Um, Living place for hopeless old people? Yeah, something like that. Turns around and the staff is hanging on his every word. Because, again, as you have to understand if you haven't seen the film, no one knows that you can lie. Right. So suddenly, Ricky Gervais, his character must be telling the truth. He somehow knows that there is an afterlife. And uh, what's almost, I want to call it a cult that forms around him, but it's not a cult. It's everyone. Right. Everyone is in, because there's, there's no room for anyone to be disbelieved in, yeah, a, uh, exactly. in a society exactly. like this. So everyone follows his word. And then you play the experiment. That's not only about religion, but that's a heavy component of it. I mean, that's something that, you know, the movie will win me over on woohoo atheism. Uh -huh. If you create a movie that's completely stupid, but a universe where God doesn't exist, hey, I'm kind of interested. But that's not even really the reason I like the movie. I'd be lying to you to say that I don't enjoy that part because I really do. But the movie questions, is it okay to lie to people and where does that lead you? And it does it on a very small, specific scale. And then it brings it out to a more grand scale. Right, right. The question you're facing with his mother is, is it okay to lie to people in order to make them feel better what what are they what do people call white lies yeah white lies well, sure. i mean i don't i don't color my lies eric ingram <laughs> but right. when I you believe, lie it's just a lie i believe they're called white lies yeah. when they don't hurt anybody and i'm the kind of person who tells the truth all the fucking time even when it gets me into trouble because i find that i get into less trouble if i don't have to come up with shit later to cover up the things that i lied about and i'm the opposite <laughs> are you absolutely but both of us, I think, would agree that we're concerned about how the world actually works. Mm -hmm. That's where the love of science, the love of uh, science-based skepticism comes from. Sure, sure. And I guess probably the atheism mm -hmm. stuff, too. We don't see evidence that there is a God. That's, that's where we reach that conclusion and where the movie does as well. So we're interested in how the world actually works. And we don't often address on the show why we're interested in that. But the invention of lying is a great it's a sort of case study in that. In how the world works if everyone tells the truth versus if everyone lies to themselves. You start to see the negative repercussions of once everyone knows that they have a mansion waiting for them in the sky. 
Um, or, you know, even the smaller lies that Ricky Gervais's character uh, tells different individuals, um, even stuff about the Black Plague that mm-hmm. happens, how those start to spiral out of control, how that stuff starts to have exponential repercussions that he could not even have thought about. It comes to a point where everybody wants to know, well, what are the rules? And he goes inside and he creates what are essentially the Ten Commandments. Right, but he puts them on pizza boxes. And (laughs) so here's here's a great example of something that ostensibly is just a stupid comedy bit, Uh right? It's just, ha-ha, look, he kind of looks like Moses. And they do it again later, and it's it's a little nauseating when he's dressed up like Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus, sure. But he kind of comes down, and I need something bigger to put him on, and they're on pizza box, and you go, ha-ha, Moses. Yes. But what you don't realize is that, again, that's just another wooden horse that's built around what's about to be fed to you. Yeah. Yeah. Here is a story that people believe actually happened, that they got the Moses had these tablets and he just gave them, you know, he came down from the mountaintop and he told everybody these commandments. The only piece of satire that's ever existed about this is the fucking Monty Python thing, the the thing about dropping the third tablet, you know, that kind of stuff. No one has ever thought for half a second that if someone came down and said they had words from God, the way that plays out in the Bible is that he tells everybody what God had to say, and they all go, huh, well, that's pretty cool. Glad God said Straight that. Up, they, went, sweet. they went home. Not a single person raised their hand and said, whoa, 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 wait a second. Let's go over that one again. Yeah. And so what we see in the film is, of course, the realistic, what, yeah, exactly sure. what would happen. Sure. Everyone would have problems. They would need to go over every nitty gritty detail. They would be thinking of vanilla and skunk ice cream. And they, you have to yes. clarify that that is not a problem in, in this made up thing that you're, you're kind of, you're adding mud to a mud hut yeah. at this point. And it's just, it's going to crumble. It's right. made of fucking mud. But you're still chucking mud at it, making it bigger and bigger, and it's just going to make a bigger mess when it all comes down. Well, no one in the Bible asked these kind of practical questions. One, because they didn't have the knowledge to ask the practical questions back then. You know, where does he live? Does he live in the clouds? Well, no, he's above the clouds. Well, he's under the stars. So is he in the thermosphere? Oh, let's move on. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. But if the event from the Bible had actually happened, which, by the way, it didn't, right. but if it had actually happened, people would have asked questions forever. That meeting would still not be over today. Well, people are still asking questions today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I come from a Christian background. Uh-huh. I am not Christian. I do not believe in God. <laughs> I think that's, that's pretty clear. I just want to make that clear. But I, I mean, I was raised Christian. I went to Catholic school till I graduated high mm-hmm. school. I went to church weekly yeah i mean i know i have the information right i mean honestly if you want anybody to become an atheist put them in catholic school have them read the bible 18 that's it put it on your summer reading list the thing is is that people still don't have the answers you know is smoking suicide is right is a really good common question yeah you know don't smoke that's killing your brain cell i don't know yeah killing your brain cells is the same as killing you because dying slowly is still dying right Suicide is the same as killing, and killing is murder, and murder is bad. Right. It's these backwards steps in order to take anything that you may not want somebody to do and being able to fit it in one of the 10 slots given. Right. It's fucking Plinko yeah. from <laughs> yeah. The Price is Right. You just keep bouncing it off shit until you can neatly fit it in one of your 10 holes. But you see people try and fill those holes in so fast. Oh, it's a test. You know, the, these right. things that people say today about religion— because they don't, Ricky Gervais won't give them any answers because he doesn't have any answers because he fucking made it up like religion. That's why we don't have these answers. They're not in the manual because this was just some stuff that was made up and there wasn't anybody around to say, wait a second, uh, what does this one mean? Can we clarify this one? You know yeah. what I mean? To step back from the religion thing, uh, the movie also asks about shades of the truth. Um, you know, lying by omission or optimism versus pessimism. You know, that scene where they're sitting on the bench and uh, Jennifer Gardner's character looks at everything uh, pretty pessimistically. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, lying also well, in this world apparently means being an asshole. She, she looks at it superficially. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And, and that's that's kind of an aspect of of not just her character, but of people at the time, because they're looking at things logic. It's a little Spock. Yeah. They're looking at things logically, you know. Her thing is that she won't get with Ricky because... DNA. DNA. Genetics, she's yeah. looking for a, a good genetic match. Cold and calculated. And that's why she's superficial. You know, she sees a fat guy and she sees a fat guy. I mean, you mentioned Spock. These are the kind of reasons people like Star Trek, the kind of 
philosophical points, challenging points uh, that something like Star Trek brings up. Star Trek is not very accessible. Even the J.J. Abrams Star Trek is not nearly as accessible as a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, you have challenging questions. You have to ask people about morality in a world where no one lies. What is the morality there? Uh, He won't sleep with the woman in the beginning who he tells that the world is going to end. Uh, that's a question that we wonder, is that about morality? Is that about, I think Boredom. it's about, it's too easy yeah, for him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's originally when it happened, I was, I was wondering, I was asking you, mm-hmm. you know, what's the efficacy of, of lying? If you've never done it before, how does one know that guilt sure. should follow lying? Right. The and question sh- is basically in that sci-fi kind of premise, does that morality, that idea of efficacy, does that come with right. the invention of lying? And I think, honestly, it does not. But mm-hmm. then later on, the film kind of goes to dismiss that and goes, not important. Look, he's breaking the rules with this bank thing. Yeah. So it's possible that he had a other motivation. Yeah. He feels bad later on. I think it's because he's kind of getting annoyed. And I think it's because... People are changing their lifestyle. I yeah. think that's. I he think he kind of, the he develops of the guilt yeah. as the film goes on. But yeah. I honestly don't believe that in doing something wrong, in doing something immoral, that if it's the first time it has ever been done, and I'm talking about this from an animal standpoint. Yeah, right. You don't realize the repercussions until you've been punished or you've you know you've seen the bad that comes from it. Man, that is a heavy question about where does morality come from. But you're talking about. First time man stands up on two legs and steals something from another right. man, does he know that that is wrong? And uh, the movie standpoint of that, you know, I disagree with you at first. I thought that perhaps the morality did come with the invention. But yeah, you see him rob the bank to give money to the sure. homeless man. So then you kind of question, well, is this a Robin Hood kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Is he saying, well, the bank has too much money or whatever? Is it a but, gray area of morality? Yeah, right. And how fast do gray areas of morality <laughs> yeah. form? It seems that they appear right away <laughs> when everyone's not just blatantly telling the truth. When you stop telling the truth, it becomes harder to figure out, you know, the gray area right. grows. But as the movie goes on, he sees the implications. He sees how far reaching this is and how everyone's sure. changing their lives. Because in the beginning, he's doing good. He's yeah. lying to do good. We see this almost this superhero scene yeah. where he's going through, passing by every character we've seen so far in the film, whispering in their ear and changing their life for the better. Yeah. Or so it seems. Yeah. And then we realize that him changing their life for the better just kind of, it's a parabola. You know, they go up and then they hit a peak and then... His lie eventually starts turning them downward and yeah, we get right. to the, the new homeless guy, right? New homeless guy who does not give a shit because his mansion is coming. Exactly. I mean, you want a pragmatic reason to not like religion. That's always the one I come back to. If uh, We've talked about this with some of the God documentaries. Right. You know, if you think that there is an infinite life right. awaiting you the moment you die, and this is just a, what a fucking test, right? Uh-huh. Or whatever people think it is. Uh, This is finite. You're going to be here 80 plus years and then you die. uh, Your test is over. You go through the pearly gates and you are there in infinity. If you could just draw out what 80 years look like on a piece of paper and then right next to it, just draw out what fucking infinity looks like. The 80 years does not matter. You don't even see it. No, you 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 don't don't see it. (laughs) That's by definition. You do not see it. And that's kind of a wonderful metaphor we've stumbled into because that's exactly how it translates into real life. You lose sight of this life Mm -hmm. you don't care about it because your mansion your mansion is awaiting you in the sky what the fuck does it matter it's the it's not just the homeless man but the conversation they have sitting around the pool Mm -hmm. where uh, it doesn't really matter i think i'm just gonna get drunk for a while drunk and watch tv yeah get drunk and watch tv and eventually i will die and then i'll get my mansion and everything you know i will be happy that's it and so this small lie that he tells uh, this small lie that he kind of tells to the entire world discourages they show they show the uh, the classic stupid movie cliche, something you would expect in a romantic comedy, the magazine covers that start yeah. flying in. Productivity is down. Everybody's thinking about m- mansions. Nobody really gives a shit anymore. And I feel like that's very realistic. I feel like that is definitely a repercussion of that kind of religious thinking, of that waiting for the afterlife and knowing that things will be good there. The only reason I do anything in my life is because I know I'm going to fucking die. Yeah, exactly. And you only have so much time to do shit. How many many times does your fucking alarm go off 
and you go, eh, I'm tired. Uh, I'm going to die. Yeah, that's yeah. the second. I mean, you yeah, don't, right. I mean, not necessarily. You don't necessarily. Your second thought isn't, I'm going to die. No, that's my second. That's but, my first thought. I wake up and go, shit, I could die at any moment. Yeah, Got to get busy. I mean, I wake up, the alarm goes off. And yeah. if I honestly, if I felt like I was going to live forever, I'd be like, oh, what's 15 minutes in bed? Yeah, right. 15 minutes on the scale of infinity is nothing. It's but, worthless. But, you know, 15 minutes on your deathbed, remembering back mm-hmm. when I'm going to die and I know I'm going to die laying on my deathbed wherever that may be and i think back to that fucking 15 minutes yeah. i stayed in bed you'll be pissed i will be so mad that's how i feel like religion is holding back human progress you can say whatever you want about the catholic church and condoms and yeah all that shit holds back you know that kind of bigoted closed-minded stuff holds right, back right, progress right. but fuck we would be getting somewhere so much faster as a civilization if people had that if people fire saw lit a candle, under their people ass. knew it was a fucking candle yeah yep. everybody sees you know they see the flame they don't see the length of the fuse yeah that's it and i think that is probably the uh the biggest problem that all of the lying in the movie causes uh, no matter how many different problems come up because of the lying That is the one thing, you know, you can have debates about morality day and night. You can talk about the love story in the film. But the one clear message that you walk away from uh, when that movie is over, that having all of these people who were duped by religion, that made their lives worse and that made society worse. And all that from a movie that you thought was going to give you Rob Schneider-esque fart jokes, right? I mean, is there a better place for that? Really? Is there a better place for that? Man, these are some funny movies. So we have a uh, email address. If you want to write to us about uh, the invention of lying or about kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Um, That is double feature show at gmail.com. We have what other stuff too? what else is on the list. We have a website. That's good. Double feature show.com. That's a good. That's one of the things that I made while I realized I was dying and I had to get busy. And then there's a Facebook, which is one of those things that you don't go on when you realize (laughs) you're dying. Also, don't use Facebook a lot because I know I'm dying. And then also we have iTunes and people aren't leaving reviews because they're too busy not dying. Yeah, they're too busy living their lives. Good for you guys. But seriously, leave a fucking review. Yeah, I mean, we are going to be here forever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you have time, this show can only get so popular so fast before it's over. All right. Well, I think that's it. That's all we got. Uh, One other thing I did want to mention. We got a donation from Erica this week. Uh, who I guess is well, like double feature show girl of the month or something. We don't have carnival positions to give away anymore. I mentioned this before, but we didn't get a lot of people writing in. So I'll just say it again. Uh, we need ideas. We were thinking about some kind of system. Everybody who donates, maybe they get entered into some kind of raffle or something. And the winner gets to pick some movies we do on the show. I don't know, something like that. So email us your ideas. It's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. We want to know what should our donors be getting? What should we do to kind of include them in on the show? And uh, the other thing is if you actually want to send a donation, everybody who donates this year on the show is going to get entered into whatever kind of crazy fucking thing we come up with. So, Erica, you are uh, what will be retroactive, I guess. You will be retroactively entered into the thing we haven't yet come up with. So be excited that you're included on that, I guess. If you want to send a donation, go to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. In the meantime, you'll be helping us out a ton. And in the long run, you'll get entered in something cool that we're going to figure out. All right. So assuming we're still alive Mm -hmm. next week, which, by the way, is an assumption I make every day that one day will not be true. But assuming it is true, uh, we're going to do some movies next week. Yeah, we're going to go back. I guess we're going to we're going to do another Trojan horse thing. Are we? We're going to do secret kids films. Oh, yeah. So this seems to come up a lot. We don't intend to do that, but they just appear. These secret kids films. So we're going to do Coraline Mm -hmm. and Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. Coraline I saw in the theaters and I fucking love Coraline and I get what's going on there. I will tell you uh, Little Nemo, which, by the way, is not Finding Nemo. Right. Everyone keeps asking me, oh, you're yeah. doing Finding Nemo? You know, when they see the schedule, you're doing Finding Nemo on the show? These are people in my life, yeah. by the way. Don't look on the website for the schedule because it's a secret. It's not on there. I have been waking up every day for several years next to someone who has a tattoo of this, and I do not know what it is. But you've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. I've been watching it since I was four years old. Wow, really? Yep. So you're telling me a uh, secret kids film thing? Yeah. This is like when uh, we watched The Dark Crystal, and I had never heard of that before. Exactly. Because the Robot Chicken episode hadn't aired yet. Absolutely. Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>